Thank you. 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 Thank you.
that expression of forgiveness that Christ has for us will not be complete. Now, here's the question. The question I was put in the question box. It says, when someone intentionally hurts you repeatedly, how do you forgive with a good spirit? And that's a really, really, really good question. Really good question. Now, let me read the question again because I, I want to... A lot of times when people ask a question, um, there's usually a little more detail that I need in some to get to dig down a little bit further to see exactly what it is they're talking about. It says, when someone intentionally hurts you... Now, we're going to talk about that intentionally hurting you in just a second. When they intentionally hurt you repeatedly, how do you forgive with the good spirit? Now, without knowing a few specifics... My answer may only seem to help a little, uh, whoever asked the question, uh, because there may be other spiritual reasons besides the hurt that's making it difficult for you to forgive. It could be uh, there, are other, there are other things going on in your own life that's making it difficult for you to forgive somebody. So those would be things that we would have to address maybe specifically uh, in a little more detail. But I want to kind of answer this question in a general way. When someone intentionally hurts us repeatedly, how do we forgive them with a good spirit? So there's a few questions I think we need to ask ourselves. A good Bible student is always asking questions. We have a complete total dependence on the Holy Spirit of God, and we must always be teachable. We have to have those three things. So here are some questions we ought to ask ourselves. First question. Is these hurts that this person is doing to us, are they really intentional? Now, let me explain that here. Many times we assume incorrectly that someone knows what they're doing when they really don't. Well, I know they meant to do this to me, and they knew I did it. And we assume incorrectly. This happens oftentimes with husbands and wives, <laughs> doesn't it? We assume that the other person understands. I've actually heard this from my own spouse. Well, if you don't know what you did, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> well, how's that going to help us? Because I really don't know. <laughs> now, that may seem obvious to the female of what the hurt was. A guy can just say, he can look and say, uh, you're not happy. Something's wrong here. What's going on? Well, you ought to know. No, I really don't. You see, this is what takes place. Sometimes the hurt that was caused is completely unintentional. Now, at the time when you're hurt, you feel like, oh, they've done this on purpose. I told them about this, and this is like the eighth time that they've done this. Well, it still might be completely unintentional. You know, it might be something that maybe they just have been in a really bad habit of doing something and they're just still trying to work out of it. So, um, here's the thing that you have to do, though. If you're one of those people, and it's not just females who feel that way. It's males that feel that way sometimes, too. Okay? So, let's be fair. So, if you're one of those people that feel that way, well, they, they know what they did and they hurt me intentionally. Take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. The Word of God is very clear in how you are to address this. Matthew chapter 18, and look at verse 15. Now this passage of Scripture here, we, over the years, we have incorrectly used this when dealing with uh, church discipline. This is not what this passage is talking about. It has nothing to do with church discipline. Uh, that's not what this is. This is actually dealing with personal offenses. And it's very clear here if you look at verse 15. It says, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, that's not against the church, it's against thee personally, what are you supposed to do? Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Now, did you get that? If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So whose responsibility is it to communicate that the hurt has been done? The person who was hurt. They say, hey, you know, when you did this, uh, you may not have intended to do this, but this, this hurt my feelings. Uh, it made me feel bad. And I'm telling you what, if Becky and I learned this one verse and actually made it a, a practice in our marriage, it has made our marriage so much better. Because we communicate with each other 
And if something's done and she hurts me or I hurt her, we can communicate that to each other. We're doing what the Bible says we need to do. We don't just say, well, they ought to know. Because they may not. And many times they don't. Now, if you are uncertain in a situation, always give the benefit of the doubt. Now, when there are continual hurts, it is to your benefit to let the person know. Otherwise, they're going to keep hurting you over and over and over again. Now, you have to assume right now it's unintentional. Now, if they told you we're dealing with intentional hurts here, if they told you they are trying to hurt you, that's pretty intentional. Okay? If they told you they're trying to hurt you, or if you have told them that they are hurting you and they don't care. I'm not saying they might, you might think sometimes they don't care, but they come out and say, well, I can care less. And they keep on doing it. Okay, now the hurts are intentional. They don't want to do anything about it. That's what we're dealing with here, are these intentional hurts. Now, if you've told them over and over again, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. What does the Bible say you're supposed to do? If they repent, forgive them. Doesn't matter if they do it again. If they repent, forgive them. If they repent, forgive them. You keep forgiving. You keep forgiving. That's what's supposed to be done. Now, if they just say, well, I don't care. I don't care if it hurts you. I don't care how you feel. All right, now that's what we're getting into. How can you forgive somebody who's intentionally hurting you over and over again and do it with a right spirit? So the, the first question was, is it really intentional? The second question would be this. What is forgiveness? It's pretty important for us to know what forgiveness is if we're going to forgive somebody. So since we're here in Matthew 18, look at verse 21, if you would. It says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had to go to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. Now, Somebody has done some calculation on this. That one talent, how much? How many talents did he owe? Ten thousand. Somebody did some calculation that at that time, one talent was six thousand days of labor. That's about ten years worth of your life. One talent. So there was somebody who owed ten thousand talents. It sounds like our government. You know, just just keep. You know, right, print money, you know, whatever. And uh, so anyway, they owed 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, surprise, surprise, his Lord commanded him to be sold in his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. Now again, somebody who did some calculation on this figured out a hundred pence is roughly four months' wages. That's a hundred pence. Now that's quite a sum of money. But how much did he have? Uh, several lifetimes worth. And then look what it says here. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me the Dalois. And his fellow servant fell down to his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not. You know why most people have a hard time with forgiveness? It's because we will not forgive. It's not that we can't forgive, it's we won't forgive. We're just like the servant. Let's read on here. He says, but he went out and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Now, does that not sound like our salvation? We owed a debt we could not pay. 10,000 pounds. Jesus Christ forgave all. And now we have a fellow human being who has wounded us with something that we can forgive. It's within our power to forgive. Now, we may not be able to do it in our own strength. But he's saying here, he's making a comparison. He says, look. I forgave you because you desire me. And then look at here. It says, verse 33, Should not thou also 
have had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I have pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise, now this is important here, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if ye, and notice this, these next three words here, if ye from your hearts. So if this person never comes to you and says, would you please forgive me? We still forgive from our hearts. If ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother, their trespasses. Now, what forgiveness means is it means to pay a debt. Somebody hurt you, they, they now have a debt. Has to be paid. And forgiveness, here's the thing about forgiveness. Forgiveness always costs a great deal. And it costs the one who's doing the forgiving. It costs them. So let me ask you a question here. If you have a good friend and they borrowed a quarter and they forgot to pay it back. A year or so later, they say, hey, you know, you're out somewhere and they say, oh, you know, oh man, you got the wallet, you got two bucks. And, uh, you know, I can use real quick, I'll pay you back and get back to the house. you okay, you give two bucks, you go back home. And they forget to pay it. Another year or two goes by and something else comes up and they say, they need a dollar. Oh, you have a dollar? Um, I, I need to do this and I'll, I'll give it to you back when we get back you know, to the house. Okay. You, I mean, is it, are you going to be bitter and upset over that $3.50 or $3 and a quarter that they owe you? Or are you just going to kind of forget about it? Probably going to forget about it, aren't you? No big deal. It's not that much. But let's multiply each of those by $1,000. Does it change things now? Yeah. Yeah. Changes everything. <clears throat> because now what do we end up doing? Because it's costing us more, <clears throat> we now start keeping a record going. It's like, good night. This person he owes me $250 and never paid it back. Now he owes me $2,000 and never paid it back. And we start holding a record here. And then he comes back a third time and says, look, you already owe me this much money. I'm not about to give you another $1,000. You see how it works? We didn't have a problem. It was just a dollar. But forgiveness always costs the one who's doing the forgiving. The forgiving. Now, when we forgive, here's a problem that we have. We can't forget. We have a hard time forgetting. But what we are doing is we can't, some people say, well, forgive and forget. You can't forgive and forget. You can forgive, but you can't forget. But what we're doing when we forgive is we are choosing to not use the act or what it was they did to us as a weapon against that person in the future. So when someone continues to recall in great detail the past wrongs that you've done, and sometimes this happens in marriages, you know, it's like they can, you know, sometimes things can be brought up that was done 15, 20 years ago. You can mark it down, that person has not forgiven from their heart. That's how you know. Because there's a record being kept. Oh, I forgive him. No, you haven't. Because you're still keeping a record. Forgiveness is not using past wrongs as a weapon against the person that may be hurting you again. Remember what Jesus said? 70 times 7. We owe the debt we could not pay. He forgave us. We ought to also be forgiving to others. Sometimes, because of our deceitful heart, we forgive the debt. But then we go back on our word. This isn't real forgiveness either. What if Christ did the same thing to us? Mm -hmm. He well, I'll forgive you your sins. And then, you know, the next week it's like, oh, I changed my mind. I'm not forgiving you. Sometimes that's what we do. We might have thought we really forgave somebody in our heart, but then we go back on our word. Because we're hurt, fresh and anew. Christ doesn't do that to us. We shouldn't do it to others. Now, it is hard to forgive because of what it costs us. But you know what will cost us more? Not forgiving. Look at Matthew 18 again. Notice down in verse 34. 
That's back at verse 33. Shouldst not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wrong and delivered him to the tormentors. How would you like to have that done? You know, as a believer in Jesus Christ, every time that you do not forgive, you're delivered to the tormentors. And it will actually cost you more than what it would have cost you if you just forgave somebody. And this is where bitterness comes into play. Bitterness is the opposite of forgiveness. The Bible talks about the root of bitterness springing up within us and thereby many be defiled. Bitterness will not just destroy you. Bitterness will destroy those, all those around you. It's a very dangerous, dangerous thing. So that's what forgiveness is. Now here's another question we ought to ask. Why should we forgive? Well, in Ephesians, this is a very simple one here. Now I kind of touched on this already. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 31 and 32. The chapter closes with two great verses here about forgiveness. It says, let all bitterness, bitterness is the opposite of forgiveness. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Why should we forgive? Well, because Christ forgave us so much more. You think about the hurts that this, let's say, go back to the intentional hurts again. The intentional hurts that somebody's doing to us over and over again, is that worse than what we've done to Jesus Christ? Not even close. Our sins nailed him to a cross. It's not even close. Now, it still hurts. It's still just as real. But the reason we ought to forgive is, one, because Christ forgave us, two, because it makes us free. We're the ones that's benefited from forgiving. And it's also the thing that we need in order to reconcile relationships. And then, if we want our hearts revived, guess what? We need forgiveness. You're, the first church I served in as a youth pastor, we, I was served there three years, and we had uh, three pastors in three years. It was a rough church. Uh, there was a large church that split twice in the three years I was there. Uh, when I first got there, we were running about six, 700 people. When I left, it was about 250. And uh, it was just a lot of bitterness in that church. Matter of fact, one pastor we was uh, considering to preach, he was a wise man. He was from Fairmont, West Virginia. Wise man. Been a pastor for many years. And I thought, man, I hope this is the guy we get. Because he really, he's gracious. He, he's just a uh, servant. He's just very spiritually minded. And he preached the message. And before he preached the message that night, he was actually there candidating. He told the people, he says, I'm going to tell you right now, I laid out a fleece. And, of course, you know with Gideon, the story there, Gideon laid out a fleece. He goes, I laid out a fleece tonight. I don't usually do this. But I asked the Lord to show me something, make it plain to me. And I'll tell you what that fleece was after I preached this message. He preached a message on forgiveness. And, boy, I tell you what, you would think after that message, it was a great message. You would have thought that the altars would have been full. There was so much bitterness in that church from people against each other. That church, so much division. So many problems, so many names called. I mean, I had people always want to punch me over stupid stuff just because I was a youth pastor and I had some guidelines in the youth group. It was ridiculous, some of the stuff that was going on. After we got done preaching that message, he gave the invitation. Not one person came to the altar. 500 people, not one person came to the altar. He played the invitation song again, went through about four or five verses. Gave them plenty of opportunity. Nobody came. He ain't told people. Because I'm telling you, here's what my fleece was tonight. I preached a message on forgiveness. And I know there's many bitter hearts here in this church. He goes, not one of you wanted to step out, come forward, get things right with God, and then make things right with your brother. And I'm going to tell you, I wouldn't touch this church with a 10-foot pole. I'm going to stay as far away from a church like this as I can because you guys are under God's judgment. Well, I was ready to stand up and wave my hand. Amen, brother! And that church was under God's judgment. And there were some good people in that church, but a lot of hurts. That church almost went to them with nothing. It's sad, but all because of bitterness. That's part of what the tormentors are doing. 
We ought to forgive because Christ forgave us so we can be free, we can reconcile relationships, and our hearts can be revived. Now, here's a fourth question, and I need to go through this quickly. How can you forgive with a good spirit? How can you forgive with a good spirit? First of all, forgive freely. Don't wait to forgive. Be quick about it. You can deal with whatever comes into your life when you are able to remove all secondary causes and see Christ at work in your life. Don't look at this wrong against you like, oh, it's me versus them. Hey, God allowed this to take place. This is a secondary cause. What's the primary cause? The primary cause is that you be conformed to the image of Christ. Christ is working on you. So remove all secondary causes. It makes it so much easier to deal with forgiveness. Forgive freely. Joseph in the Bible, in the Old Testament, Joseph didn't forget what his brothers did to him, but he forgave them anyway. You see, he saw God's hand at work. He said, it wasn't you that sent me hither, but it was God. So forgive freely. Secondly, forgive fully. We should be so full of forgiveness because of what we have been forgiven. Oftentimes we just forget what we've been forgiven. Yeah. That's the problem. The only way we can forgive this way is in John 15, and I, I don't have time to read this, but I strongly encourage you, John 15, read verses 1 through 8 about abiding in Christ. Here's what his, verse 7 says. It says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. That's a powerful verse. Psalm 119 verse 165 says this, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. That word offend means to cause to stumble. You know what bitterness does? It causes you to stumble. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. We need the Spirit of God abiding in us, and that enables us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to be able to forgive fully. So forgive freely, forgive fully, forgive finally. Don't use it as a weapon against them. In Isaiah 43, verse 25, this is what it says. It's talking here about God, and it says that God will not remember thy sins. Now, does God have a bad memory? No. No. Is it that he forgot our sins? No. He's choosing not to bring our sins back up again. That's what he's doing. We are to be like him. In other words, don't keep score. This is the 18th time that you've done this to me. Remember 70 times 7? Don't keep score. So we need to forgive finally. And then lastly, forgive forcefully. Because forgiveness is not natural. There's a hard thing. Forgiveness is not natural. It is a spiritual thing. But because it's not natural, this is why it's not easy. Everything that's natural is easy. <laughs> what if God said in the Bible, hey, when somebody intentionally hurts you over and over again, on that fourth time... Pick up the heaviest thing you can find and whack it upside the head. That'd be pretty easy to do, wouldn't it? That's what your flesh wants to do. You see, that's easy. But the spiritual things, however, are not so easy. That's why we can't react in the flesh. So we need to forgive forcefully. 2 Corinthians 12.9 Actually, if you would turn here, this is where we'll close. Turn to 2 Corinthians 12, 9. I want you to see this verse. Paul is going through a long list here to the church of Corinth about things that uh, he's had to deal with, that Paul himself has had to deal with. He was talking about his thorn in the flesh and how he sought the Lord three different times. Lord, please take this thorn uh, in the flesh away from me. And then God finally gave him an answer. You see, this is a hurt that Paul had. Some type of hurt in his life. So, so many people think it's something his eyesight. We don't know what it was. Uh, but anyway, listen to what it says here in verse 9. And he said unto me, this is Jesus speaking back to him. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Do you need God's strength? Yeah. I need God's strength. His strength is going to be made perfect or complete only in weakness. And Paul said this, 
Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. When we talk about forgiving forcefully, why was it that Paul said he was going to gladly glory in his infirmities? It was because so he could have the power of Christ. Isn't that what we need in order to forgive? Especially if somebody's intentionally hurting us over and over again. That's why we need his grace. We need his strength. So here's what we need to do. In order for us to forgive somebody who's intentionally hurting us over and over again, here are some things we must do. If you don't do these things, you're not going to be able to do it. It can't happen. Here's what they are. Purpose. To saturate your heart with the Word of God. You've got a purpose to do it. You've got to saturate. I'm talking, you can't read a verse a day to keep the devil away. You better read chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter. And if you have to, read an hour a day, five hours a day. Whatever it is you need, saturate your heart with the Word of God. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. You see, we need to have God's Word in our heart. We have the purpose to do that. Here's another thing we need to do. Purpose to saturate your life with prayer. Pray for the one that is hurting you in such a way that they can experience God's blessings. What if the person's lost? Pray for their salvation. What if the person's saved but they're just being a jerk? They're a terrible brother or sister in Christ. Pray that God will get a hold of their heart in such a way that God will be able to pour His blessings down upon them. Pray for them. Pray fervently for them. And I guarantee you that will change your heart in a hurry. You don't have to pray God's wrath down upon them. Pray for their benefit. John 15 verse 7 says, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, saturate your heart with the word of God, ye shall ask, there's prayer, what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Powerful stuff. And then something else we can do is realize forgiveness has a high price tag attached to it. It is always going to cost the one that does the forgiving. But forgiveness is far cheaper than the cost of not forgiving. Remember the tormentors. It's far cheaper to forgive than not forgive. Purpose to not compare. And here's where a lot of us get in trouble. Purpose to not compare their offense to you with your offenses to others. That's really why we have a hard time. Well, I wouldn't treat anybody that way. Instead, what we ought to do is compare their offenses that they did to you with your offenses that you've done to Christ. That's really what we ought to do. Many Christians get stuck in their Christian growth because they refuse to forgive or they refuse to do these last things. Saturating their heart with the Word of God, with prayer, realizing forgiveness has a high cost. It has a high cost. But it's far cheaper than dealing with the tormentors. And make sure you compare their offense to you with your offense to Christ. And we get to a place where we don't apply these steps in our life. And what happens is we don't have Christ's power in order to forgive. That's how Paul was able to gladly glory in his infirmities. That the power of Christ could rest upon him. That's what we need when it comes to forgiveness. There is no greatness in the Christian life without forgiveness. Because this is one of the greatest attributes of our lovely Savior, Jesus Christ. Forgiveness is not easy, but it's necessary. This is what God has for us. I hope this helped answer the question you were asked the question. And if you didn't ask the question, I hope this was a help to you as well. But this is one thing we all deal with on a regular basis. Because we all are going to get offended. We're all going to get hurt. And sometimes it's we're hurt the most by the ones we love. And it happens that way. But as a Christian, we still need to forgive. And if you're here tonight not sure heaven's your home, Christ wants to forgive you. He wants your sins to be forgiven, put under the blood. You need to get that settled. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for your blessings. <laughs> and Lord, we're so thankful that we can experience forgiveness from you. Lord, I pray.
and I know, Lord, this is not, it's easy to preach this type of message. But boy, Lord, it sure is hard to practice it. But this is really where the feet hit the ground. This is, this is the real thing right here. This is the real part of living a Christian life, is being able to forgive. And Father, I pray that you help us to keep looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, not looking at the one that's hurting us, but Lord, we can truly saturate our heart with the word of God. We can pray effectively for the one that is hurting us. And Lord, we can compare their offenses to us with our offenses that we've done to you. Help us, Lord, for Christ's sake, because you have forgiven us. Help us to be forgiving one to another. And Father, we ask and pray these things. I ask you to bless this song of invitation time now. In Christ's name we ask it.